good evening again and uh, coming to the end of the day in Australia, I guess in other parts of the world, different times. Um, we still have quite a few questions unanswered, but that's probably good. So if you've got unanswered questions, it means you strive more to find answers. But I'll do my best. There's one here from the monastery. How does the Lord Buddha respect our ability to choose right from wrong, good from bad, and that which is to our benefit from that which is to our decline? Uh, well, the Lord Buddha absolutely respects your ability to choose because he's perfectly equanimous before, towards uh, the choices of other people, other beings in the world. Um, but out of wisdom and compassion, he shares his understanding of from what his uh, knowledge and vision of the world brings to light what is right and wrong in the sense of what is conducive to complete freedom from suffering and what leads to more suffering. And as we've been discussing, you know, we suffering has its causes. Ignorance, craving, attachment, becoming, birth, aging, sickness, death, sorrow, lamentation, pain, grief, despair. You know, that's the, these, these phrases come up over and over again. So the Buddha has explained very well what causes suffering, craving. Yes. Craving um, for sense objects, so sensual desire, sensual craving, karma tanha. Vipa vadanha, craving not to become, not to be, not to have. Craving to become, to be, to have. Which um, is the cause for clinging clinging to the body, clinging to the sense of self, clinging to the sense object, clinging to views, clinging to uh, rituals, practices, but clinging as in clinging with ignorance. So this is what he revealed through his own practice and laid out for the world. But he said he can't do it for you, he can only point the way. We have to investigate and practice learn for ourselves. So you may you know, doubt what the Buddha said, that's fine, you go away and practice. Um, what myself and many others have found is the depths of wisdom, the profundity, the completeness of the Buddha's wisdom seems to be true. And so over the time studying and practicing what the Buddha taught, more and more it seems to be correct. So when he talks about wholesome karma, unwholesome karma, good and bad karma, it seems to match my experience, the experience of other wise people in the world seems to match with what the Buddha said. But it is up to us to find out for ourselves. Um, and unfortunately, many people in the world are caught into what we call wrong view. So many people think karma doesn't exist, it's not true, it doesn't affect us. Some people think everything is predestined by a God or a, some other force, universal force. Some people think everything is just random, it doesn't matter what you do. You know, morality, good and bad, doesn't really exist. There's a whole spectrum of views out there in the world. But my personal experience is that you know, the more and more I practice, the more my views seem to fall in line with what the Buddha taught, and he seems to be correct. Um, but it really is up to us to try and learn for ourselves. And the, like, the Buddha never forced anyone to believe what he said. He always said the Dhamma is to be investigated. It's, in, it's apparent here now, it's encouraging investigating, investigation. It's to be known individually by the wise. So it's not something you just pass from one person to the other. It's not a belief system, you just 
get people to believe in and try and convert them to your point of view through any kind of coercion or converting them. You're really giving people the means to learn from them for themselves through their own experience. And that's the best way, isn't it? You know, when you learn through your own experience, you really know, you really believe because you've seen it, experienced it for yourself. As monks, we actually have rules that prevent us from trying to convert the unconverted, teach to people who um, don't want to be taught, teach people who are not respectful, not interested. We actually have rules that... Uh, stop us from teaching. We have to wait until we're invited. The people want to hear. So if there's nobody there who wants to hear and listen to the Dhamma, well, we just go on and carry on with our practice until someone turns up. <laughs> uh, which is a kind of built-in protection to stop monks, maybe through their enthusiasm or their own strong beliefs and attachments in the path and the teachings going out, trying to proselytize or convert people which may come back on them. So, the Buddha did give many teachings on what is to our benefit, what is to our decline. So you take them on as a, a working theory and you test them. So like, for example, when he talked about the Sangha, the community of monks, the Buddha said, if the monks meet together in harmony regularly, that's good for the practice because it provides a good environment for each individual to benefit and pursue their practice. You see that with Ajahn Chah, he encouraged Sangha to meet regularly, respect each other, particularly respect elders, to um, cooperate, for elders to look after the more junior ones, teach them, take responsibility for them, for the junior ones to listen and respect to the elders. We look after each other when we're sick, we teach each other, we remind each other of what the teachings are, what are the training rules. When that happens, then the Sangha thrives and prospers and lasts a long time. So Ajahn Chah really emphasized that, and you see even after Ajahn Chah's death, he's, he died 30 years ago, the Sangha is still prospering because these principles have been taken on here and in many other monasteries around the world. And they do seem to lead to benefit. And sometimes you notice whether it's in a Buddhist community or in other communities in the world when people don't follow these principles, well, they get division, strife, people drop away. Those communities tend to not prosper. So that's one example of prospering and decline. When we follow the path of preventing the arising of unwholesome dhammas and abandoning unwholesome dhammas that have arisen and cultivating and bringing up wholesome dhammas and developing wholesome dhammas that have arisen, when you follow that, which is what we call right effort, it definitely from my experience leads to your benefit whereas if you're not making any effort to abandon the unwholesome and cultivate the wholesome you can easily fall into decline and that you can prove very quickly in your day every day of your life you can start to see that you know, say you get angry and you follow your anger it becomes very destructive and you cause you and yourself a lot of harm you and others a lot of harm if you make efforts to restrain anger, abandon it, it's for your good in the long run. You have to investigate that. So over and over again you prove, it, seem to, it seems that you prove what the Buddha said is correct. But you have to understand this through your practice. There's a question here from Taiwan. 
Greetings Ajahn, in terms of making offerings to the Sangha, I understand gold and silver are not allowed. But how about some other jewelry such as pearls, diamonds, precious stones? Uh, <laughs> not sure what we do with pearls, diamonds, precious stones, but one thing that is they are used for quite wide in a quite widespread way throughout the Buddhist community and including Sangha is for we say for worship of Buddha statues or more particularly Buddha relics, the relics of the Buddha or perhaps arahants, but particularly the Buddha. So people build stupas, chedis, and quite often there'll be some installation with relics of the Buddha, Lord Buddha, in them. And sometimes they place precious stones around the relics just as an act of veneration, worship. Or they embed them in various decorative features around the relics. Or Buddha statues sometimes have precious stones <coughs> put into them, as well as gold and silver melted into them, say. It's a very old... Uh, tradition in Thailand when you pour a Buddha statue the next month we'll be pouring a Buddha statue for Bodhipala monastery in Adelaide and it's quite common that uh, people offer jewelry uh, gold and silver that will be melted into the bronze most of the statue is made from bronze but um They'll put, uh, put gold and silver jewellery into the, the cauldron, which is boiling the, the uh, bronze ore ready to be poured into a mould. They'll put gold and silver jewellery in there out of faith in the Buddha. And it tends to go into the beginning part of the pour, so it flows through the mould down to the head. So the head of the Buddha tends to have a lot of gold and silver in it, but it's not completely gold and silver unless... That was the plan, and occasionally they make those Buddha statues, but and they cost a lot of money. But generally, there'll be a lot of offered gold and silver jewelry which goes down into the head of the Buddha, such as our Buddha behind me. Um, and it's expression of dana as worship for the Buddha. You know, I don't need this jewelry for myself anymore. I'll offer it for the Buddha. So it's quite a beautiful. Thing. And if you go to one of these ceremonies, sometimes they, they pass a, uh, a receptacle, a pot or something around the assembled people who are there for the Buddha, Buddha casting ceremony and people start putting in their jewellery. Some bring it, especially occasionally people are inspired on the spot. Spontaneously they take off their rings, their earrings, their chains and put it in to the Buddha, uh, which is always quite kind of exciting uh, expression of faith so it's quite enjoyable and everyone goes Sato. <laughs> so we've had uh, husband and wife take off their gold wedding rings and say we don't need these anymore we've been together for 40 years and we don't need a ring to prove our love and commitment now we're going to offer them to the Buddha and they throw them into the pot and they melt and become part of the Buddha's head and everyone goes, Sato. And uh, we hope that they stay together happily after that. <laughs> and they usually do if they get to that point. Um, and other times, other times, you know, something that's very precious to you, you know, your family heirloom, you offer to the Buddha, something that has real meaning. Yeah, that can be a, quite a, a powerful moment for someone to do that. So like I've carried the tray full of gold jewelry before. So then, you know, people say, are you allowed to carry gold? Because it's actually one of those things we're not supposed to touch, gold and silver, which is probably where this question has come from. Uh, no, we're not normally allowed to touch or get involved with gold and silver. But you know, when I was doing it, I just saw myself as a servant of the Buddha, I'm just holding this tray, people decide to put their gold jewelry on it, okay, and I give it to the uh, guy who's making the 
boiling the, the bronze for the cast and just give it to him. So I'm just a servant of the Buddha. You know, I'm not touching it or getting involved with it, really. Um, when we did our Buddha here, it was a couple of kilograms of gold jewellery. It's quite a lot. It's a big Buddha statue. We're allowed to pick up gold and silver in the monastery. If someone drops their jewellery, we're allowed to pick it up, save it for them, keep it for them, as we are with money. As far as precious stones, well, uh, same people offered precious stones to embed in this Buddha statue behind me and in other statues and in chedis and... Occasionally the monks look after them until the job is done. There's no real other use for them as a monk. <laughs> Sajjan Chah used to say about diamonds and rubies, he said, stone? It's just stone? <laughs> rock? <laughs> it's just rock? Because uh, that's all it is, isn't it? Dear Ajahn, Thank you for your time and guidance. During sitting meditation, I have noticed numbness around the foot after sitting for 30 minutes. Is this to be expected in a beginner or related to incorrect posture and positioning? Apart from taking note of the sensation, are there any other strategies to increase endurance apart from increasing practice? Um, well, you hear me often say, find the comfortable posture. It's something you have to learn for yourself. Your body and everybody's body is different. Your muscles are different. Your bone structure is different. The way you sit is different. So you have to learn what works for you. Numbness usually is an indication that the blood flow is impeded. So see if you can wiggle and <laughs> move and find the posture that works that your blood can still flow and then you'll be able to sit longer. But you also have to practice. And I tell people who are you know, fed up with the pain in their body that when I started I could only sit on the ground for three minutes and I was in agony and then I had to get up. It was so bad. But that was just through not having done it before. And I worked very hard for a couple of years so I could sit longer until I could sit for a few hours with not much pain. There's always a little bit, but not much. So it was uh, doable. But numbness is usually a sign there's too much pressure in one place or another. So you have to learn where, where can you release the pressure, just adjust your posture a bit. And also with ageing it can change, or sometimes with injuries and other health issues it can change. Um, of course, when you get into your meditation, you're really absorbing your object. You lose awareness of the body. The body drops away. And you're just with the mind. The mind becomes still. And so you may come out of that state of stillness, samadhi, and suddenly feel pain or numbness. But usually when you get up, there's no permanent damage or anything. It's just because you've let go of your body and gone into the mind itself, you're not noticing. And you know, some, some people go into deep jhana for many, many hours, but it's, they're not experiencing the pain in that state. Or in upajara samadhi, you can still experience pain, but you also have a lot of pity and sukha, and your mind is calm. The hindrances are... They've gone quiet, but you're not completely one-pointed, which is why you can still experience pain, so you can contemplate it. You use the rapture and the sukha vetana, the pleasure of, of the samadhi, to help buoy or support your mind as you're looking back and contemplating the selfless nature of dukkha vetana. So Ajahn Man and other teachers used to say to the monks who could enter jhana, they said, don't enter jhana. Come out of your jhana and contemplate your attachment to your body. Because in jhana you can't contemplate, you can't practice vipassana in jhana. You have to withdraw and use sensations and the different aspects of the five candors arising into your awareness to contemplate, to see impermanence, not self. So 
some monks even got told off for entering jhana <laughs> which seems crazy doesn't it for most people who cannot enter jhana and to be told off for entering jhana and that sounds wrong However, the thing is if you're skilled in it then it becomes a habit you enter your jhana and have bliss and you can stay there a long time but maybe wisdom insight is not developing yet you have to withdraw from the jhana and contemplate the body and the body is a source of suffering and that's why when you really see that and let go of the mind's view that body is permanent, it's happiness itself, seeing through that is where one gets a lot of breakthroughs and realizations. Question from Malaysia. Recently my father is getting weaker. He is unable to walk long distances and has been using the potty to urinate because he can't rush to the toilet in time. Mum has been taking care of him. I am single and currently unemployed. I have an option to go home and stay with my parents but I am reluctant to as I don't get along with my parents. I am feeling guilty. Can you please advise? Um, well, I don't know all the conditions all the aspects of your circumstance but generally speaking the Buddha encouraged us to help our parents give something back to them and that can be a very good practice especially if you do have some relationship problems and issues with your parents maybe this is the time to face them and go through them and go beyond them by helping giving something back to your sick father caring for him being with him meditating for him helping him to hear the Dhamma if he can still listen uh, and providing assistance and by that you may go beyond previous karma of you know, negative disagreements and the difficulties of living together as a family um, so if you're unemployed you're available and it's possible well that is certainly one thing you should consider can I give something back to my father or assist my mother in looking after my father certainly wouldn't be a bad thing it'd be very powerful good karma for you in your Dhamma practice generally so if you have that opportunity well why not if you don't have the opportunity well you can still send your thoughts from afar practice metta meditation and send your thoughts and dedicate the good things you do to them and keep in touch obviously so it's definitely worth thinking about the option to return home to help and when you help an elderly parent you're also learning about it for yourself and it's quite a, an important lesson learning about the aging of the body sickness what's going to happen to you later you, you, you not only are helping them but you're actually helping yourself during that process Another question, my mother is presently dying or yet comfortable in palliative care. As an only child, much of supporting her transition falls to me. Accordingly, please excuse any such absences from this inspiring retreat. You're forgiven. On your advice from earlier in the retreat, yesterday I offered apologies for any transgressions I may have made. My mother looked at me as if I was silly, which is kind of reassuring. Yep, exactly the same thing happened to me. Um, the question is, apart from the meta practice you have shared previously, are there any specific chants that may help them at this time? Um, depends on your mother if she already has a grounding in Buddhism and she may have favorite chants herself or meaningful ones well that's one area you may look at chanting reciting Dhamma chanting Dhamma that she already knows and inspires her if she's new to Buddhism or not unfamiliar with chanting well something like the Buddha's words on loving-kindness are very powerful for many newcomers to Buddhism um, you can also chant in Pali even though she may not understand the words, the meaning you may if you've read the translations and that may generate a good powerful wholesome energy in yourself and then you can spread metta to your mother and chanting in general 
can be very soothing for a sick person to hear someone else chanting for them or nearby. And similarly, meditation, practicing meta, meta meditation with them, sending your thoughts to them, can also be very soothing and reassuring and uh, positive energy uh, right to the end of the last moment of their life. You can do that if it's appropriate. It depends on the situation. So chanting and meditation can be used if they can join in or they're aware, they can listen and sometimes you can also play tapes or you know, recordings and also Dhamma. Play Dhamma talks to them if they're responsive. That's another option and you also gain, don't you? You play a Dhamma talk and you sit and listen to get together. That can be good for both of you. Um, but yeah, asking forgiveness is a tricky one because some people are sharp and they say, you're asking forgiveness, you must think I'm about to die. <laughs> so it can be a little bit tricky, approach with caution. Um, but generally it's the way to go, isn't it? In case there is lingering bad feeling, at least you do it in a formal way. Sometimes people offer flowers to the mother or father. Sometimes do it as a group, brothers, sisters, relatives. <coughs> And yeah, people do often do feel awkward or embarrassed doing it or receiving it, the mother, but it's still worth doing. And if they think about it later, they might be quite happy and realize that it was a good thing. It clears the air uh, and it's better to do it and feel awkward than not do it and then regret later that you didn't do it. Um, so unfamiliarity with some of these practices does bring up, you know, feelings of awkwardness, embarrassment, but as you do it more, that fades. Even something like walking meditation, you know, the first time you do it, sometimes you're a bit self-conscious, aren't you? Walking back and forth and people look at you and you're sort of wondering, oh, what do they think of me? But as you do it more, you realize it's a good thing to do. You're becoming more mindful, some insight is arising, then you don't care what people think because you know you're doing a good thing. Much of Dhamma practice is like that. We are self-conscious, awkward at first, but as you do it more, you get into it and you benefit from it. So, chanting iti piso, the Buddha's words of loving kindness, suttas, paritas. If you've chanted paritas before, that's they're good to chant. Uh, any chant that is meaningful to you, you'll tend to put more effort into it, so that's one guidance. Uh, and any chant that's meaningful to your mother, that will also be a guideline as to what to chant. When Lumpo Anand's mother was sick in hospital in Rayong, when I lived there, sometimes she'd go, she was so weak, she'd be into the ICU unit, and the monks would go in and chant. And they said they never had so many monks chanting for so long in the hospital there before. And um, you know, once or twice she came out of hospital. You know, the, she, the chanting really seemed to boost her and she came out. So sometimes you chant for someone, it can lift their spirits, boost their recovery a bit. Sometimes it's just soothing them, bringing their mind to reflect on, on the Dhamma and, and brings up wholesome thoughts as they're dying. Depends on the situation. Question from Singapore. Dear Ajahn, I meditate for a couple of hours. It used to be when I first started out, I fell asleep very easily during meditation. <laughs> I think we all know that. After I became more serious and meditated a couple of hours daily, I have the problem of sleeping. I end up, or problem with sleeping, I end up sleeping only four or five hours or less. When I lie down, my mind falls into noticing the breath mode and I can't sleep. My mind becomes more awake, but my body, body is tired. I like to stop the noticing the breath mode when I lie down. How do I stop this noticing the breath mode? Besides giving up med meditation totally so I can sleep more. I think many people do experience this um, in one way or another. Um, one thing to remember is kind of your body is self-regulating really. If you're really exhausted, you will fall asleep. 
and when you're practicing meditation it does wake your mind up because you're more mindful and you're taking the breath as an object and you're cutting through a lot of drowsiness, dream states so perhaps you only need so many hours sleep, you know, less than you used to have and another thing is you're also more me aware of your body as you meditate so you notice tiredness more and before you meditated perhaps you still got tired you just distracted yourself from it with thoughts and other external things so that you didn't really feel tired so much because you didn't notice it and this is a very common thing with meditators they're starting to become much more aware of their body sensations in the body, feelings the breath, how much they sleep, digestion and sometimes they even say it's because I meditate that I feel like this whereas I mean that's possible but generally it's more that you're now waking up to the way the body is whereas before you didn't notice it and the body is dukkha it brings us all kinds of uncomfortable <laughs> unpleasant feelings and sensations every day and now you're being mindful of the body so you notice them and that requires a lot of patient practice and um, you know don't be caught into the view if I meditate well I should have no more pain in my body and no more illness and no more pain in my legs it's not like that it's your, your attitude changes towards the body and towards painful feelings and pleasant feelings because you're developing insight into not self your view changes so you know, enlightened monks still get pain enlightened monks still lie there in breath mode <laughs> feeling the pain of the body uh, when you're tired you'll fall asleep so kind of allow for that and part of the problem is our reaction to not sleeping isn't it we get worried oh I'm not going to get enough sleep what am I going to do tomorrow just relax I say, when I sleep I sleep if I'm still awake following the breath as I'm lying here, fine. Just go into breath mode for a while and eventually you'll fall asleep. A lot of the uh, problems are how we react to things. So we don't like pain, we don't like feelings of tiredness. So we think, think about it and we worry about it, we get uh, um, irritated or lying in your bed at night not falling asleep you get worried about that and often you're just creating a suffering out of a fairly normal experience so um, yeah, I, I sometimes physically tired so I just lie there but I'm not sleeping so I just go with the breath it can, you can if you really work at it you can go into deep samadhi lying down but it's hard work but you can do it and uh, Ajahn Chah, in the last 10 years of his life, he did still sit up. He didn't walk anymore. He was either in a wheelchair or in a bed or in a chair. And he clearly could enter deep samadhi lying down. And he spent a lot of his time mindfully watching the breath at night. I could tell because I spent hours and hours and hours with him at night. And when he was asleep he'd close his eyes when he was awake he had his eyes open and sometimes he'd have his eyes open all night long so he's clearly mindfully lying there on his bed aware of many things we believe even if he wasn't communicating directly so maybe just adjust your view your attitude towards this issue as, uh, and, and you know, try not to worry too much about it I think Another question from Singapore. Dear Ajahn, my limit to sitting meditation is 30 minutes. When I try to sit longer, my mind becomes loud and I keep thinking of the pain. And I think you've got a few friends here. <laughs> my legs get painful after that. How do I meditate longer and be more patient, ignoring the, th the thoughts of pain? Well, thoughts of pain, yeah the thoughts about the pain. The pain you may not be able to get rid of but what you think about it you definitely can change. And it's through practice like you say. You know, most people can only sit for short periods in the beginning but if you do it regularly 
both your body gets used to the posture, your mind settles down, your mindfulness improves, your wisdom improves, and you can deal with some of these very obstacles we've been discussing better, and then they start to not bother you anymore, and you sort of move through them. You know, it starts with itches and pains, and then gradually you get used to being with pain sometimes. So sometimes you can just sit there with pain, but it doesn't bother you because you can put your mind on the breath or you can be aware of the pain but you're not thinking with aversion, you're just knowing it. So your attitude changes but also your body gets used to it the more you do it and that helps. And also you get smarter in how to manage your body and you know, if you need to sit on a chair, you can sit on a chair as well. Um, And sometimes you just have to go for it, don't you? You just sometimes you just teach yourself. You reach your thirty minute limit and you say, I'm gonna stop and they say, No, I'm not gonna stop, I'm just gonna sit another thirty minutes. Ha ha <laughs> You bring up the Dhamma and say, Ha ha, I'm gonna push it a bit today within reason and you just do it and sometimes you get that extra determination and you burst through thoughts, worry, sleepiness, anger or anxiety about pain. Sometimes the pain disappears, sometimes you just learn to be with pain. But sometimes it disappears. If you attain some samadhi, you may not feel pain during that period. And sometimes your best meditations is when you try harder at the moment you want to give up. And you have that thought, I can't stand it anymore, which is just a thought. And if you have enough mindfulness to catch yourself, and say, oh, it's just a thought, so what? You carry on sitting. There's nothing left, is there? Oh, you've had that thought, I can't stand it anymore. But you didn't follow it. You're just sitting there trying to watch your breath and it's like, oh, so what else? <laughs> what else is there to complain about? I've had that thought already. It's like when you're a complainer, you, know, you can't keep complaining about the same thing. Everyone's heard it. So if your body and mind are in a bit of pain and your mind has been going, I can't stand this, I'm going to stop. See if you can just watch that thought disappear. And then you might go into a deeper place in your samadhi practice. And we learn in fits and starts and we do a bit and then we come back and sometimes you, know, you, you learn a bit more in one area of your craving and attachment and letting go of it and sometimes you seem to it seems you're going nowhere and then the next minute you find it oh i've really learned a lot actually and we surprise ourselves main thing is to keep going with patience with effort and learning from your experience question from canada Ajahn, thank you for the morning Dhamma talk on conditions for anger to arise on the, uh, followed by the sitting. I found it very meaningful. This sequence gives us opportunities to reflect what you said during the sitting. My question is, do you do this as your normal teaching sequence? I find that the usual teaching sequence is sitting followed by the Dhamma talk at retreats. Uh, I haven't been monitoring this. I mean, you can do both, can't you? you? Sometimes we sit and then there's a talk, sometimes we give the talk and then we carry on sitting. Both are good and sometimes we just sit in silence and sometimes it's just a talk and you don't get any silence sitting. <laughs> you, know, you get all versions. Uh, and of course, when you're more experienced in meditation, you also get the chance to just practice on your own and see what you like and what works for you. One of the things with retreats is it's a time just to give up to the retreat. It may not be exactly how you like it, but that doesn't matter. You're giving up your preferences in, in the retreat. You know, Sitting when they sit, walking when they walk, listening when they listen, eating when they eat. And of course you learn what you really like and what suits you and what doesn't. But during the retreat you just give up to the retreat sh schedule. And most people find that quite useful in a way because you're giving up a little bit of your attachment, even in the retreat. You know, when you say, I'd rather go off and do my walking, but they're making me do the sitting. Okay, but you're letting go of a little bit of desire there, and that's useful to learn that. So just make the best of whatever's on offer. <laughs>
As Ajahn Chah used to say, you're better to eat plain rice than nothing at all. For monks, we go on arms round in the villages, and in Thailand, sometimes you only get plain rice, but you can survive on that for a day, and maybe tomorrow you get a better meal. Meditation is the same. You know, some days things are going well, you're peaceful, you're seeing Dhamma, understanding Dhamma. Other days, the mind is all over the place. So the days when the mind is all over the place and it seems like nothing is working, that's a plain rice day. And when you seem to have good insights and the peace and the rapture is coming up, that's a rice with curry day. And you know, sometimes it's plain rice, sometimes you get curry and dessert as well. You have to accept whatever the world brings you. <laughs> Dear Lumpur, a question from Malaysia. Can you please give guidance on how to do walking meditation? Do we need to recite the word Buddha while walking and be aware of the movement of our feet? Should I walk naturally or must walk in slow motion? <laughs> There's no one answer here. The way uh, Ajahn Man uh, taught and I think Ajahn Ma Acha took it on was to use the word Buddha, reciting it as you walk. You walk fast, you walk slow, you recite Buddha at the same time and you're aware of the feet touching the ground. And monks, we do a lot of walking. We walk through the forest, we walk on arms round, we work and we do formal walking meditation as well. So you get used to it. You go into walking mode, being aware of your feet touching the ground, Buddha. So then you can take it up at other times. You're just walking through the forest and you can still or we actually go wandering, walking on a walking tour, what we call Tudong. And you're using Buddha, maybe going along the road or the pathways. Slow motion is fine, and particularly on a retreat like this, where you might be at home in a small room, then that's all you can do. Maybe just walk very slowly up and down in your room because of the limitation of space, and that's fine as well. But if you have more space, you're outdoors, like here we have long walking paths, you know, 20 meters say, you don't need to walk slow, but you can walk slow if you find that helps you. Sometimes people find you, they become more mindful when they slow down. But some people like to walk faster and they find that wakes them up and makes them mindful as well. And you can experiment. Ajahn Chah said, if you're really sleepy, you can't sit, you're too sleepy, you're walking and you're sleepy as you walk, then walk backwards. If you walk backwards, you have to be careful because you're going to trip over. So you, walking backwards, you tend to be very slow and very mindful. You may just do it for five minutes to wake yourself up, but you can experiment. And also be careful because sometimes when we are sleepy at night and we're walking, we walk into things. So I have walked into a tree once in my life, in the dark at night, in the forest, very sleepy, like 1 a.m., 2 a.m. And uh, just got to the end of my very simple walking path in the forest. It wasn't in a monastery, it was camping out in the forest. and. Uh, I was a bit drowsy, so I bumped into a tree. No serious damage, but it did wake me up. Um, here in this monastery, I bumped into a wombat once, simply because I didn't see it, because it was down there, and I'm up here with my eyes here in the dark, so walking along, bump into wombat. What does wombat do? Wombat looks at me and goes... <clears throat> And I said, yeah, sorry, I agree, I shouldn't have done that. <laughs> I let him go and he seemed okay with it. Um, <laughs> wombats, they do have a nice little growl they use on occasions, um, but generally they're not aggressive. Um, next question, we've got two more, so I'll try and finish. How does a person identify when they have attained the first jhana? <laughs> Well, one thing, go and describe to a teacher who is experienced would be a good thing to do. You can read the books, but there's still a little bit of doubt there. Uh, Anjan Cha and many other teachers in the forest tradition don't talk too much about jhana because people sit there doubting, am I in jhana, was that jhana? And you know, they actually, it becomes an obstacle or a form of attachment during the meditation. 
he used to say, just know if you're peaceful or not, if the hindrances are present or not. So study the five hindrances, what they are, and notice if you're still wondering or doubting, you know, is this jhana or not, a hindrance has come up. Any mental agitation is a form of hindrance. It can be very subtle or much less subtle. Um, sensual desire will slip in, won't it? You can be getting very peaceful, very refined concentration and then suddenly a, an image of something or a memory pops up and uh, you lose your concentration. So be be careful. But generally, you know, you can read the suttas on samadhi. There are the five factors, vitaka, vichara, piti, sukha, eka, kata. So the body and mind are light. You feel very light at ease, content. The mind is merging with its objects, just knowing the objects, not wavering around, it's not thinking of many other things. And if one attains that, one can sit there maybe for a long time. Pain doesn't bother you anymore, sounds don't bother you, thoughts don't bother you, you're just knowing your object and merged into the object. The mind is bright. It's like someone turned the light on inside. The body is very light, so you feel almost, you may have different kinds of pity arise. You feel like you're floating in midair. That's why you can sit a long time. Pain and heaviness of the body, tiredness is gone. And then you withdraw from that and you feel awful, maybe. <laughs> oh, body. But then you contemplate your attachment to the body and your mindfulness will be very good coming out of jhana. That's why they do it, because you're, it's like charging up your mindfulness so when you come out then you can follow every thought that arises with mindfulness. You can see it arising, you know it, you don't get lost in it. Feelings, memories, and you're not getting lost in them because mindfulness is maintained. So it's, this is where vipassana is at its best, coming out of a state of samadhi, stillness. But you just do what you can. If you get a few minutes of samadhi, fine. That's good as well. You just keep working at it. And don't worry too much about the terms and the descriptions. You, know, you, you read them, you hear them, and then set them on one side. And your main priority is watching your mind to see what's going on and know whether you're still falling into the hindrances or not. Last question from Australia. This is related to something you mentioned earlier. You said that when insight arises, so do pity and sukha. Does the reverse hold true as well? More specifically, if pity and sukha arise during a super practice, does that necessarily mean that some insight into the nature of the body has arisen? If so, can this happen without the meditator's awareness at the time and no apparent change in perception outside the cushion? Thank you for your wisdom and compassion. Um, sometimes it seems to arise automatically, like you're sitting meditation for a period and then you have an image of the body, a part of the body, the body is a corpse, or a part of the body, the skin, the bones, the hair, something comes up. Automatically, the mind just presents it to you as an image. We call that an asupanimita. With that, you generally have a feeling of well-being. You may well have pity and sukha arising at that time. And that helps you to keep focusing on that image, and you may explore the image, focus on it, question it. When your mindfulness and samadhi is deeper, that image may change. So you know, you've probably read biographies of meditators who've suddenly had a f image of themselves as a corpse or, or as a dying person and then they die and they turn into a corpse and the t corpse becomes skeleton and then disappears. So people do have these experiences. Um, you said, if so, can this happen without the meditator's awareness? Well, normally you would be aware, very aware, very mindful, very clear in what's happening because when you're in samadhi, your mind is clear. It's not lost in daydreams, imagination, and so on. But perhaps what you mean is, is it something you've conjured up or is it emerged out of your samadhi automatically? And yes, it can come up automatically. Um, 
and people have come on, we've had retreats here and people have had images of themselves as a skeleton or as a corpse. It occasionally happens. Don't worry if it doesn't happen, doesn't matter. But if it happens, it's not unusual. Um, and piti and sukha, these are, as we've said, they're just they're factors of samadhi, they're wholesome dhammas, they're a sign that you're mind is becoming peaceful, that it's going probably in the right direction. They can still become a basis for attachment. You, know, you, you like your pity and sukha, you want it, you want to hold on to it, you want to get it again when you lose it. So be aware of that. There's still what we call <coughs> sankhara and vetana, which are impermanent. So don't be surprised when pity fades away, sukha vetana fades away, because it will. But nevertheless, they're a sign that the mind is gathering its internal energy. You know, naturally, if you're turning away from your senses and the world, you're usually relating to through your eyes, ears, nose, tongue, touch. Now the mindfulness is turned inwards. You get a lot of extra energy from not going out to the world through your senses. That energy brings, usually brings a sense of well-being, pity and sukha arise as the mind is turned inwards. So, and these are very nourishing qualities for the mind that help you to continue towards one-pointedness, which is your aim to get to the point where the mind is totally one-pointed. Then it can really contemplate, practice vipassana and see and each dukkha anatta very well because of the one-pointed state of mind. But you know, just keep going, keep practicing, and uh, learn from your experience. So time is up, questions are up. We'll leave it there for tonight. Uh, tomorrow will be the last day of the retreat, so. Keep putting forth effort until the end. Don't get caught up into the tricks of the mind, thinking about what you're going to do afterwards. Just, you know, and just, you just become restless waiting for the end of the treat, retreat. It's very common. Try not to get caught into that. Take every moment as it comes. And uh, we'll see you again tomorrow. <laughs>